Um, by the way, what we're doing in um, Isaiah now is we finished Isaiah, but since we don't have much time left to start a new prophetic book in this semester, we're going back and we're looking at highlights. The verse today is particularly memorable because it really is a prophecy of the Messiah, the suffering servant. And that's what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks is look at select verses from Isaiah, verses that will knock your socks off. Um, and so let's talk about the gospel today because it's a long selection and there's some interesting things. We begin with the fact that Jesus talks about prayer. First, he teaches a version of the Lord's Prayer. The full version is found in Matthew's gospel. This version is a shorter version. But whenever Jesus talks about prayer, the basic response, as C.S. Lewis admitted, would be, wait a minute, what do you mean whoever knocks, to whoever knocks it is answered, whoever asks receives, and so forth. My prayers go unanswered all the time. But here in Luke, Jesus says something that he doesn't say when he talks about prayer in the other gospels or the, re the saying is recorded differently. He says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will our father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? We don't really know what to ask for from God. That's maybe one way that we can explain how Jesus promises that prayer is always answered. Sometimes it doesn't seem to be, or sometimes it's answered with a no. But if you ask for the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? It means that you ask for the presence of God in your life. It means that you ask him to abide with you. It means that you want him to transform your life and make you a good person, that the very spirit of God should be with you. The one thing that's clear in this little admonition of Christ's about prayer is if you ask for the Holy Spirit, you will always get the Holy Spirit. You might not sense his presence. You might not know what that will mean. But part of what we're doing in this class is asking for the Holy Spirit. All education, all art, all attempt to do something worthwhile and seek something meaningful is an attempt to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says a few other things that I think are kind of uh, interesting. We'll look at them. First of all, I think this is interesting. Sometimes Jesus says things that are a little harsh. When he was saying this, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that nursed you. But he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. I wonder, you know, I don't necessarily think this is addressed to any Marian devotion, because I don't think there's evidence of that this early in the church. Marian devotion, there's no real evidence of that, at least not this early, during Jesus' lifetime. And yet, you know, when you think about it, when I became Catholic, that the Marian stuff is weird, as is burying statues of St. Joseph and so forth. Mary is beautiful. Devotion to her can be a wonderful thing. I'm not saying that it's wrong, but I'm saying it's odd. It's odd to someone who used to be an atheist and a Protestant because it's like, what's, what is this? Is Jesus saying, okay, fine, my mother is blessed. However, don't focus on the blessed virgin alone. Don't go to her and stop there because blessed is everyone who hears the word of God and does it, obeys it, lives it, acts it out. In other words, 
we all become as blessed as the woman who gave birth to Jesus and nursed him, which is Mary is the most highly blessed of humans. But you will be blessed. Jesus takes the focus away from his mother or that saying of enthusiasm and sort of says, okay, curb your enthusiasm. Hear the word of God and do it which in a way is conceiving God, the logos, the word in you, giving it birth and nurturing it. That's kind of what we do. We serve sort of as parents of Christ when we bring him to bear on earth. He also talks about this generation will only receive the sign of Jonah. By that, I think he means both Jonah is in the belly of the whale for three days, and Jesus will be in the tomb for three days. But he also means Jonah preached repentance to Nineveh, a city of sinners who were not Jewish and who did not know the true God, and they repented. He didn't want to preach repentance to them, but reluctantly he did, and they repented. And that will stand as a testimony against this generation who see and hear Jesus, but put him to death. By the way, this generation is also our generation because we do that all the time, day in and day out. A greater than Solomon is here, but the willingness of the Ninevites to repent will stand as a sign against this generation. Jonah, the reluctant prophet who brings even the Gentiles to repentance is the sign that shames the Jews who have everything. The Jews have the revealed religion. They are the people of God, but they are hard-hearted. I'm not being anti-Semitic. I don't mean the Jews in general are. I mean, that's part of the message of the gospels is that even the people most favored harden their hearts to God. In our case, it would be the Catholics. We are in the position of the Jews. We have the fullness of revelation. But Jonah stands as a witness against us because Jonah goes to Nineveh. In other words, secularists, pagans, and they repent, and we don't. You've always got to bring, bring these readings home, bring them back to you somehow. There's a lot more in Luke, but I've talked for a long time. If you have questions or comments, put them in. Moodle. You know Moodle. We love Moodle. Do your best.